This is Duke University. Today, Professor Samuel Buell takes your questions about white collar crime. Buell is a professor at Duke Law School. A former federal prosecutor, Buell served as lead prosecutor for the Justice Department's Enron Task Force. His research and teaching focus on criminal law and the regulatory state. To ask a question, send an email to live at duke.edu. Tweet with the tag Duke Live or post to the Duke University Facebook page. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. Good afternoon and welcome to Office Hours from Duke University. I'm Mike Schoenfeld. I'll be your host today. We're coming to you today live from the Duke Law School, a special edition of Office Hours, where we're talking to Sam Buell, a professor of law and a specialist on corporate regulation and white-collar crime. Sam, welcome. Thank you. The, uh, uh, the uh, uh, program today uh, is... Uh, demands, I should say, your participation. So we'd love you to take part in office hours. Uh, you can do that in one of several different ways. You can email live at duke.edu. You can tweet Duke Live, or you can visit the Duke University homepage, uh, the Duke University Facebook page, and leave your questions there. Um, we'll be going uh, for about an hour, and we'll look forward to your participation in this program. Sam. Um, White-collar crime is one of those great terms that uh, sounds good in a headline and, mm -hmm. and uh, on a Law and Order episode, but uh, I'm not sure it's something that, that people can that necessarily think about the definition. How, would you, how do you define white-collar crime? Well, it's a difficult <clears throat> uh, question, actually. There's, there's actually an academic literature on the question of how do you define white-collar crime. Um, the, co the term was actually coined in the 30s by a sociologist uh, at Yale University who uh, wrote a book about um, about the subject, the first major book on the subject, and and he uh, he he described it as a crime committed by a person of high social station, uh, and that's clearly not a very uh, useful definition because of course people of high social station could commit all kinds of crimes, and, and we talk about so for thousands of thousands of years. Right. Yeah. So so we talk about a white collar crime. We're not we're not talking about crime among the wealthy class as much as we're talking about crimes associated with business and economic activities. Um, crimes that are defined in terms usually of some kind of um, wrongful conduct in connection with financial transactions, economic exchange, or often dealings with the government and the regulatory system. Uh, and, and are they typically crimes committed by, well, let, let, me, let me ask uh, in a different way, uh, crimes committed by individuals or crimes committed by organizations, by institutions? How, how do those distinguish? Both. So a lot, a lot of people would use the term corporate crime, uh, although I wouldn't quite use it this way. I would use, you'd use the term corporate crime to refer to uh, the prosecution of white collar crimes against firms, uh, and the term white collar crime to mean generally all those kinds of criminal offenses that could be prosecuted against individuals or firms that take place in the business context. So how, um, help me understand, how do you prosecute a firm? How do, how do you say that you know this this firm has done something wrong, and then how do, and then how does society deal with that versus how it deals with individuals? Right. So the the most corporate uh, firm prosecutions happen in federal court, just by virtue of the fact that it's the federal government that has the um, interests and the resources in prosecuting those cases, and most often the underlying crimes involve something having to do with federal law. So it's generally federal law that governs. And uh, under federal law, uh, corporate criminal liability is based on what lawyers call agency theory, which basically means if somebody commits a crime in the course of their employment, and in part to benefit the employer, then the employer may be held liable criminally. It's that simple. Uh, it's, it's really not that different from the legal rule that applies to whether you can uh, sue a corporation for a product's liability or some kind of tort harm. It's just that the underlying wrong is, is a crime, not a, a, a simple negligence or carelessness, uh, that, a product's liability, that kind of thing. That is not necessarily the rule in other jurisdictions. So many states have a different rule about corporate liability where the prosecutor would have to show more, like for example, that um, a managerial uh, person was involved in the crime. Uh, other countries have different kinds of rules on uh, corporate liability. 
But in federal court, where we see most U.S. cases, the rule is actually quite easy for prosecutors, and that means that the decision about whether to prosecute a corporation is really uh, governed much more by discretion than it is by law. And then, uh, and who, 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 if you prosecute a, a corporation, not to be too simplistic about it, who serves the time? Right. So you can't imprison a corporation. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, there's a famous 19th century English. A jurist who, who, who uh, uh, remarked about corporate criminal liability, there's uh, uh, no soul to be damned and no body to be kicked, so it doesn't make any sense to have criminal liability for corporations. But of course, corporations can be fined. Uh, they can be subject to uh, probationary-like conditions that uh, would be analogous to what we would do with an individual in a probationary context. You have a series of uh, uh, directives from the court that say, you know, you must do this, that you may not do any more of the following. If you don't follow these rules, you'll, there'll be additional penalties. So you can have that kind of a, a forward-looking probationary arrangement. And then, um, you know, the thing that really distinguishes corporate criminal liability from corporate civil liability is the potential reputational and stigmatizing effects on a corporation of being uh, charged with uh, pleading guilty to or admitting or being convicted of a crime. And uh, that the fear of that stigmatizing effect that criminal law can have in the corporate context actually produces, I believe, a level of deterrence around corporate criminal liability that's not uh, possible with uh, mere civil penalties. How ha uh, over the years, obviously, the financial system has changed dramatically, become far more complex. The uh, uh, global trade has become um, much more important, a much more important aspect of business. How has corporate crime, white collar crime, however, however it's defined, how has that evolved over the years? Well, I think um, there's more of it than there used to be because the markets in which it occurs are bigger than they used to be. Uh, and so it is a larger uh, problem uh, by scale. I don't know if it's a relatively larger problem than it used to be, but it's a larger problem by scale. And the international aspects are certainly a new challenge in the sense uh, of the U.S. government, as well as other governments that are active in this area, trying to figure out what the proper scope of their interests are in, in uh, enforcing white collar crime in the corporate context. And the area in which this is most controversial right now is the uh, under a law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is a law that makes it uh, criminal to for corporations to engage in bribery abroad this in furtherance a, a of their US, business. American law, US law. This is a US law, it's actually in our securities laws. It was it was enacted as part of originally as part of the um, Securities Acts in the New Deal during the nineteen thirties. Um, but it's had a new life recently by virtue of the fact that there are a lot of U.S. corporations doing business abroad at a scale they were not previously, and um, there's a great deal of corruption, as everybody knows, in many areas of the world. Uh, many corporations would argue that it's necessary to doing business in parts of the world. The, the U.S. government, uh, uh, the, the current executive branch, as well as its recent predecessors, believes that the U.S. has a very strong interest in um, penalizing the uh, use of bribery to facilitate business abroad, that it uh, potentially puts U.S. corporations at a disadvantage. So there is um, more what I would call extraterritorial white collar prosecution going on now. Just to give one example, uh, in recent years there was a massive Foreign Corrupt Practices Act case involving the Siemens Corporation, which is a German company, does business in the United States. We buy much of its equipment in our uh, medical systems here in the U.S. Uh, but it's based in Germany and it does business all over the world and the U.S. Justice Department did a big a Corrupt Practices Act case against Siemens, and most of the allegations in that case had to do with bribery uh, operated out of Siemens headquarters in Germany occurring in other countries. Uh, now, uh, related to that, is there, is there a body of international law on corporate crime the same way there is, uh, say, for human rights, war, telecommunications, things that, that cross borders, or is it very much a country by country? It's very much country by country, <laughs> although I think you raise a really interesting question. Uh, both in terms of where the law is going and in terms of where I need to go as an academic. So uh, there are many of us who are experts in aspects of U.S. law who are constantly feeling in this day and age that we need to be uh, smarter about international law. And it's not an area of specialty for me. I've been a, an expert in domestic U.S. criminal law and corporate regulation, and I'm always feeling like I need to um, get better in that area. And uh, and just as a general matter, but, but specifically with regard to uh, clashes that may be starting to develop in different approaches. For example, the UK recently passed a new uh, anti-bribery act of its own, and it apparently is going to start launching a more aggressive effort to enforce 
uh, against bribery practices abroad out of the UK. Their statute, I think, looks very different from ours, so you could see some real conflicts there, and that's something that I, um, I know I'm going to be needing to pay more attention to in the coming uh, years. So I'm uh, just curious, how, how would we as a, as a legal system, as a country, uh, react to the UK or some other country attempting to prosecute an American company for, for something that they did in, um, I'm, I'm probably getting a little tortured here, right. for something that, that happened in the United States. In other words, are, are there sovereignty issues involved here? Or? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that prevents that. Uh, okay. You know, if, if each jur jurisdiction has its own uh, rules that allow for those prosecutions, uh, they can be going on uh, simultaneously. Uh, one country could uh, uh, do something when another country chose not to, uh, and there really wouldn't be any way to uh, go to some higher body and uh, resolve that or ask one country to, to step uh, down. I think a lot of it is going to have to do with uh, what the nature of the relationship is between the U.S. and some other country that's enforcing and, uh, and whether these things, there, there is a dialogue always going on with the countries that we're uh, cooperative and friendly with, especially the Western European countries that have advanced regulatory systems. There's always a dialogue going on about um, uh, mutual reinforcement interests and uh, what to do about cases, but um, if people don't agree, then they're just going to go uh, do what they want. And um, I think it's a big concern in the corporate sector right now if, is the uh, possibility of getting, getting kind of um, whipsawed by uh, different approaches in different jurisdictions and not really having um, any sort of higher body that can be appealed to except the discretion of one actor or another. You know, the, these guys are handling the case this way over here. Can you please be consistent with them at least so that we have one set of, of uh, concerns that we need to worry about? How, uh, um, a case uh, uh, involving outright theft or mm -hmm. uh, bribery, so, you know, sort of clear-cut, bright-line kinds of issues are, are, can be fairly easy to understand. Uh, there's somebody did something bad mm -hmm. <coughs> um, or has allegedly done something bad and that has to be proven in, in a court of law. But um, what about cases involving things like uh, criminal negligence? How does, right. how, how, do, how, do, how does somebody looking at corporate crime distinguish between incompetence um, and, or neglect and outright criminal right. behavior? Well, uh, <clears throat> primarily we do that through the criminal laws tools relating to mental state inquiry. <clears throat> and uh, we attempt to find in the criminal adjudication system a sufficient degree of knowledge or intent with regard to the wrongfulness of the action to uh, conclude that there is a criminal responsibility. Uh, we usually call that in the law, in the fraud context, the specific intent to defraud, or in the obstruction of uh, justice context, context, the specific intent to obstruct justice. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, negligence crimes in uh, the areas of serious white collar crime, like insider trading, securities fraud, yeah. obstruction of justice, the, Oops, the kind I of big, mean to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, the kind of big ticket cases that you read about in the New York Times and the right. Wall Street Journal. Um, now, there is a legitimate concern about whether, uh, given the inherent fuzziness of the law in white collar crime, that there might be some cases that are in fact negligence cases that are being treated as more than that. In other words, mistakes are being made, but. Uh, the, the law of criminal fraud in federal court, for example, does not set out to, at least on its face, punish negligence. Where, where we do uh, see um, criminal negligence cases uh, in white collar crime is usually in some specific regulatory areas like environmental uh, law or food and drug law where uh, th there is a specific regulatory regime that governs what the company does that has many requirements that they're well cognizant of and uh, sometimes if there are negligent violations of that, those regulatory regimes, they will be punished with uh, criminal penalties, but they're usually, uh, for negligence cases, quite light. Uh, you know, be a misdemeanor type thing, a relatively small fine. In order to take the penalties up higher, you, you generally, un, in, the, in the law, would need to show more than negligence. You would need to show some kind of knowing or willful violation. So for example, in the BP oil spill, um, there, the, the government could easily bring uh, uh, criminal negligence charges under the Clean Water Act. They may be able to prove additional things, of course, in the BP case, but they could easily bring criminal negligence charges under the Clean Water Act. But those would carry, um, uh, those would carry only uh, you know, a certain level of fine, and nobody would be eligible to do a significant period of imprisonment for that.
You are watching Office Hours from Duke University. We're at the Duke Law School today with Sam Buell, professor of law and an expert in white collar crime and corporate regulation. You can reach us by email at live at duke.edu. You can tweet us at Duke Live, and you can join us at the Duke University Facebook page where you can also um, uh, interact with, your, uh, with others who are watching this as well as on the Duke University Ustream channel. So please do join the conversation and um, we have a couple of questions. Okay, so great. So let's, uh, let's go to the questions. This one is um, by email. Uh, <clears throat> people think of white collar crime as a different, softer order of crime. It is, it is difficult, is it difficult to prosecute crimes that people don't raise the same public condemnation as violent crimes or drug crimes? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think any trial lawyer on the defense or the <laughs> prosecution side will tell you that uh, there's almost always more wiggle room in a white collar case uh, at trial than there is in a violent crime case. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is the one alluded to by the question, which is that uh, by nature, uh, there's some moral ambiguity often in these cases. Now, you mentioned earlier, there, you know, you might have a flagrant bribery case or a fra flagrant theft case. But if you think of something that's a little bit more complex, like an accounting fraud case, you know, very complex corporate accounting that led to some shareholders being misled. Many people had some part in constructing it. There are issues about who knew what. These are, to some extent, morally ambiguous situations in a way that you wouldn't have in a murder case where you have a dead body lying on the ground and the question is who done it. Uh, so uh, it's more often, you know, in murder cases can be very triable because the question, there's alibi issues or you don't know who did it, there's identity questions, but, uh, but, but generally uh, white collar cases are going to be much more uh, contestable at trial because uh, not only is it going to be difficult to prove, um, you know, the acts themselves might not necessarily have been criminal just looking at them. It's a question of what did people know, what were their mental states. State of mind is always difficult to prove. You have to prove it circumstantially, and jurors have to reach certain inferences. And in that process, inevitably, people, I think, are going to feel that there is a level of kind of moral ambiguity about white-collar crime that you don't find with violent crime. What's interesting about that, though, is that um, I think as that a process plays out at trial, there's some inconsistency with what you see sometimes in public attitudes about the general problem of white collar crime. So if you ask people generally about white collar crime, you'll often get answers, I think, where people will say, I think this is in many cases just as bad as violent crime. Depends how many people were hurt and the level of venality involved in the conduct and so forth. But people can, be, can find themselves just as outraged, I think, at some level about white collar crime as about violent crime. But from the legal system's perspective, if you take a single case, and you subject it to the trial process. In my experience, and I think most lawyers experienced in this area would tell you, that the white collar cases inevitably have a kind of ambiguity about them that the violent cases don't. The, um, uh, one, one aspect of that that's very intriguing and, that, and that's playing out in the papers, which is uh, where we see it, is the aftermath now of, of the Bernie Madoff fraud, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where you, you have, a, uh, I guess, a special master who, a magistrate who, uh, I forget my, the technical term, the, um, who is going? Right. He's a receiver, or special uh, yeah, master. Spe yeah, special master. Who is uh, going after the profits mm -hmm. that individuals who had no, may have had no idea um, uh, of the ex that that any fraud was going on? The clawback, basically. Right. Um, talk talk a little bit about that. Is well, that of course a, is he's that a not, common concept? He's not prosecuting anybody. He's not prosecuting. He doesn't have but, the power but, to prosecute. Right. This but, is, but a it civil, is a civil procedure. Civil procedure. Uh, having to do with uh, recovering lost, uh, uh, lost investment funds. Um, I haven't followed the particulars of the legal regime that governs, uh, I think his name is Picard, the gentleman who's, who's doing this. Um, but, but, but it wouldn't surprise me if all he has to show is a kind of a negligence. I mean, if he had to show that these other investors were aware that what they were invested in was a Ponzi scheme, uh, then uh, that'd be difficult to prove. Maybe there's such evidence in the Madoff case, but it'd be, it'd be difficult to prove. Uh, if all he's got to show is a negligence that is a, a failure to take care, a failure to be aware, a uh, failure to have done a due, sort of due diligence to discover that what you were invested in was a Ponzi scheme, well, obviously that's going to be much, uh, much easier to prove. And, and I just don't know what the standard is for, uh, for a clawback there. Obviously, if we step back from the legal particulars and we just look at it from the standpoint of people's um, uh, sort of gut intuitions about this, um, there would seem to be 
something to the idea that not all the victims in the Madoff case are going to be similarly situated, and that, uh, that to the extent that everybody's taking a hit from this massive Ponzi scheme, the damage ought to be uh, distributed in some kind of way that has to do with fairness. I mean, it's, it's not all that different from what you would see in a, um, one of these big um, settlement fund problems, like the BP spill funds or the 9-11 funds or these things that you know, Kenneth Feinberg, the att Washington attorney, is often being uh, put in charge of. Uh, you've got a, a, a pot of money that's left over, and, and a lot of people have suffered some harm, and you've got to figure out some equitable way to distribute it. And that doesn't mean that everybody gets, you know, if 60% of the money's left, everyone should get 60% of their losses because the victims may be differently uh, situated. Uh, that last question, by the way, was from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. This is from Mel via email. It seems like moneyed white collar criminals have endless resources to spend on figuring out ways to operate in the gray areas of white collar criminal law. How do prosecutors and lawmakers keep up with sophisticated, wealthy criminals? But how does he really feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is actually an excellent, uh, an excellent question because uh -huh. it points to really one of the fundamental problems in this area, and it's one that I've written about in my scholarship, which is um, what, what lawyers would talk about or legal academics would talk about it as the choice between rules and standards. So, uh, so when you're regulating a corporate activity, uh, you could have a regime that's very specific. Uh, you know, we look at a case like Enron, for example, and we say, well, there were six things Enron did that were problematic under the accounting rules uh, that led to people being misled. Uh, so let's make those six things impermissible, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of corporate regulation is done that way. A lot of what the SEC does uh, uh, is done that way. Of course, that, that strategy is very characteristic of our tax laws. But as the questioner points out, uh, we're talking about an area where we're regulating individuals who um, are generally quite sophisticated, have a lot of resources. So they have the ability to get um, the best legal advice that's available out there. Um, they have every economic incentive, and we would expect them to have it. There's nothing morally wrong with having an economic incentive to, uh, you know, to maximize your profits within the law. They have uh, every incentive to figure out ways to design their behavior around the regime. Um, then you're constantly involved potentially in this game of cat and mouse. So, so how, does the, how does the law um, deal with this? It, it, it deals with it by adopting a very general fallback standards behind these specific regulatory regimes that say things like, do not commit fraud, right? Uh, and uh, the idea is, look, just because you've technically complied with the accounting rules, for example, does not mean that you are free and clear if you know that the sum total of what you're doing is creating something misleading. Uh, is, is intentionally committing fraud. Uh, they can be uh, still, you know, someone like that could still be prosecuted under the um, securities fraud laws, the mail fraud laws, and, and um, you know, we have things like the Antitrust Act, which is very vague in the antitrust area, which is designed to kind of serve a fallback function like this. And the idea is to tell regulated actors, look, you do have some kind of uh, overriding underlying obligation that you have to uh, worry about. Uh, that you can be prosecuted for violating, notwithstanding your compliance with the specific rules. And um, now the trouble is that then you get into very difficult questions about the enforcement of these anti-fraud rules against people who claim, well, look, uh, I had legal advice that what I was doing was OK. Uh, I dotted all the I's. I crossed all the T's. How can I be prosecuted here? This isn't fair. I didn't have fair notice of what I was doing, uh, that what I was doing was wrong. And this is a constant. Uh, real attention point in the law of white collar crime. Now you uh, started a law firm, you uh, and then you went to the Justice Department, and um, ended up uh, or uh, were selected to uh, be on the prosecuting team for the for Enron. Mm -hmm. um, what what talk a little bit about that? What was your role in uh, that was obviously a hugely complex right. um, enterprise? What was your role, and what are some of the the lessons, I guess, that um, that you took from it, both as a as a prosecutor and now as an ac as an academic. Well, I mean, the, the Enron case uh, for me was just an example of I think what happens to a lot of us in our careers, which is just happening to be in the right place at the right time. So I was actually doing organized crime prosecutions in Boston at the time Enron went bankrupt, and it turned out through you know a long story I won't tell that somebody who'd been a mentor of mine. Uh, earlier in practice um, happened to get appointed to run the Enron case and she called me up and asked me to come do it because she wanted people she knew you know she'd worked well with in the past and successfully and um, she had at that point deep experience in the law of white-collar crime and wasn't too worried about that part uh, 
uh, and I got up to speed very quickly. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I was part of a, a, a team that um, ended up being about four or five of us uh, prosecutors who were pulled from different parts of the country to uh, do the case as a task force out of Washington because the Houston U.S. Attorney's Office had been recused. There were too many conflicts in town. Um, basically everybody in Houston either lived with or was related to somebody who worked <laughs> at Enron. Um, and uh, and we, we stayed as the team on the case for about the first two years up until the point at which Jeff Skilling, the former CEO, was indicted. And then uh, most of us left at that point uh, for personal reasons. We had been on planes for two years away from home um, and uh, just weren't going to be able to keep doing it. And we brought in a, a, a new team that took over and then took the case the additional two years it took from that indictment stage to through the, the trial. Um, and I went off to teaching at that point. Um, what did I learn from the Enron case? Uh, the lessons always change. I mean, I think that's the nature of history, is the, the more distance you get, the more the lessons change. I mean, the lesson that I've been thinking about very much in the last couple of years has been uh, the extent to which, at the time of Enron, we thought it was kind of the 9-11 for the financial markets. You remember it happened just a few months after 9-11, and it seemed like an unthinkable event. You know, uh, the seventh largest corporation in America implodes overnight and ends up being a uh, um, in many ways, uh, a completely different situation than people had believed. I mean, this isn't something that had happened before, at least not for a very long time. Well, let me, let me, so let me on that, let me ask, what, was yeah. Enron unique because of the size, or was it a new kind of corporate crime? Like well, uh, this is really what I, the, the point that I was getting to, is at the time it seemed like it was something that uh, was unique. Oh, gee, we had this, this company down in Houston that had kind of gone crazy with this structured finance activity and created something that was really uh, kind of a whole corporation that at some level was, you know, half or three quarters of it was sort of illusory. It was, you know, on the books, but it didn't really exist. Um, and we thought, well, gee, you know, it had not occurred to anybody that that kind of thing could happen. Uh, but now, if you look in retrospect, I mean, Enron was really the canary in the coal mine. The things that Enron were, was doing were actually uncannily similar to what you see uh, in terms of the activities in the mortgage-backed securities market that brought down the investment banks in 2008. And it, what's really remarkable to me is the extent to which we didn't learn any lessons from Enron. Uh, the, the, and sometimes I think it's sort of ironic that I may have played a role in that and the extent, to the extent that um, uh, Enron was treated as a, uh, as a case of criminal wrongdoing, and it's, it certainly was, uh, that the focus was on the few wrongdoing executives and not uh, as much on, well, what does this tell us about the system? and what kinds of things are happening in the corporate finance world right now that are risky and dangerous. Um, and, you know, we had a, a legislation after Enron, but it was a, um, a controversial legislation that uh, kind of took a shotgun approach on a series of small problems. It wasn't a comprehensive kind of a fix. And along came the financial crisis in 2008, and we saw happening in the mortgage-backed securities market a kind of massively exponential version of what was going on in Enron, where it was essentially um, kept doubling down the bet on its own stock price, and as long as that stock kept going up, the financial structure was going to hold. Uh, but as soon as that assumption turned out to be, uh, you know, a, not a, a one-way assumption, the stock could go the other way. The whole thing came down, and the same thing happened with the real estate market. So let me ask the obvious question, which commentators have been asking um, for the last two and a half years: How come we haven't seen prosecutions? How come right. we haven't seen the the kind of um, uh, activity from the criminal justice system that we saw with Enron and that one might expect given the situation? Yeah, well, that's a difficult question to answer uh, from the outside, not knowing what the government is, has looked at, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I get asked that question a lot by the, by the press. Um, I think, you know, if there were really easy cases, we would have seen them by now. Uh, and I don't think that the government would shy away from doing easy cases. I mean, look at what it's doing in the insider trading context right now. We've got some massive prosecutions underway, one that's, you know, getting a lot of press that's going to a jury today in New York. Um, these are, um, at some level, I'm not saying the government's necessarily going to win them all, but they're at some level easy cases. They've got people on wiretaps talking about confidential information and saying, hey, let's make some money off of that. Uh, you're not going to have that in the, you know, you're not going to have the ch chairman of Lee Lehman Brothers on a wiretap talking about, gee, we're, we're in deep, deep trouble here, let's tell some lies to try to keep the boat afloat, uh, which would be the kind of thing, that those would be the kind of facts that would uh, give you a, a 
fraud case against a high-level executive in connection with the with the financial crisis. So you you don't you're not going to have wiretaps. Obviously, you don't have anybody. You know, you need documents. You need witnesses. Do they do they have that? Well, it's it's you know the normal way to produce that is to do some lower level cases and work your way up. And I, I just think the government probably has had a hard time finding cases at the lower and mid levels where they've got uh, uh, clear evidence that's going to satisfy a jury beyond a reasonable doubt at a criminal trial uh, to put some pressure on some people who would be in a position to testify about what some of the conversations may have been internally and then look at those and see whether there actually is a criminal case there. These are complex cases. We thought Enron was complex at the time. These are even more complex. And uh, the other problem is uh, prosecutors want theories that are containable. You know, they want to be able to defend the decision on, a, on the matter of discretion as to who was prosecuted and who wasn't uh, so that they can say, look, we're acting in a principled manner. One of the problems with the financial crisis is some of the theories that are getting thrown out there about who should be criminally prosecuted and what they did was a fraud are much too expansive. They're theories that would include half the people on Wall Street. And a prosecutor not only practically can't bring that case, uh, on a matter of principle, they don't want to bring that case. They don't want to say, you know, we're going to treat a whole industry as criminal. It do doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think they're, they're probably struggling with that issue as well. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, they did try one particular case a year or two ago that was kind of what you would it's view as an early stage, pick a case off at the middle or lower level, and it was a case against some Bear Stearns traders that was uh, prosecuted in the Eastern District of New York, and the jury acquitted. And they thought they had pretty damning emails in that case. And uh, what that shows you is that the, the sort of question that gets posed by, you know, Matt Taibbi when he writes in the Rolling Stone magazine or the guy who made the, you know, Inside Job movie of why isn't anybody in jail? Uh, uh, is a kind of socio-political question, right? Uh, that's not what juries do, right? Juries get asked, does this guy sitting over here commit a crime? Has the government proved it to you beyond a reasonable doubt with tangible evidence, documents, testimony um, that have stood up in the crucible of cross-examination and, and the best defense lawyering money can buy, because these are, of course, very well litigated cases. Uh, that's a whole different question then are we mad and do we think someone bears responsibility for this at some level and ought to be in jail. So I think people don't really understand um, and, and why should they be expected to uh, the, the kind of behind the scenes particulars of what's required in really putting one of these cases together and being successful. It, is the success rate for prosecuting white collar crime equivalent to that of prosecuting say violent crime? No, okay. no it's, it's a fact that uh, uh, I mean, it's a little hard to, to say because it's true that in all categories, uh, an overwhelming percentage of the cases plead guilty, um, not only in federal court where most of these cases are done, but in most jurisdictions. The guilty plea rate is north of 80 percent in almost every jurisdiction in this country. In federal court, I think it's over 90. Um, but if you, so, so, so criminal trials are less common than people think they are. But if you look at the ones, the sample, the ones that we do have, I do believe the acquittal rate is significantly higher in, um, in white collar cases. And I, would, I can't prove this, but I would attribute it to two, two primary factors. One is the quality of defense lawyering. Um, uh, and you know, it's a sad fact that in our criminal justice system, uh, money talks. And uh, you know, that doesn't mean that necessarily uh, one ought to think that white collar criminals deserve less effective uh, defense lawyers. The problem is that the, in, in the violent crime cases involving indigent defendants, uh, very often the defense lawyering is substandard. Um, so, so it's the quality of the lawyering and also, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, the built-in uh, complexity and ambiguity in these cases. So you're necessarily going to have a higher level of acquittals just by nature of the uh, complex facts, uh, somewhat complex law, and subtle, difficult issues about did somebody quite have the light, right level of mental state. You are watching Office Hours from Duke University. We're here today at the Duke Law School with Sam Buell, professor of law. And you can join the conversation by email at live at duke.edu. You can uh, tweet us at Duke Live, um, or you can uh, join the university, the Duke University Facebook page and uh, get to us from there. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, George, by email, uh, writes, given its complicated nature, does white-collar criminal law require more input from academia than other kinds of criminal law? Um, I think so. That's why I chose to go into this field. Okay. Uh, obviously, it's in my interest to say so. But I, I do think that um, you know, I, I got into this area as a scholar because uh, 
of working in it for a couple of years and having worked in many other areas of criminal law before that and seeing, you know, oh my gosh, at a, at a, at a basic conceptual theoretical level, we don't really have this stuff figured out uh, in the way that we do with uh, core, uh, most, most core crimes. You know, there was a big project done in the uh, 1950s and 1960s by a bunch of academics and judges and lawyers um, called the Model Penal Code, which was basically an effort to create a, a model set of statutes around the basic crimes, rape, murder, robbery, burglary, theft, and, and so on, and have some clear rules that could serve as a model for how you would write a criminal code. The Model Penal Code was very, very influential. Uh, I think over half the states have adopted it either in part or in full um, uh, in the last half century. It's the fundamental thing we teach in the first year criminal law course in law school. The Model Penal Code doesn't have a whole lot to say about white collar crime. And the reason it doesn't is because it wasn't such a big deal in the 50s and 60s, but also because it wasn't so easy to reduce to some basic clear rules that everybody could get agreement on. Um, and so it is, it, is, it is the one area of, of, of what we call substantive criminal law, that is, as opposed to criminal procedure, the rules about what's a crime. Uh, it is the one area that is still very much in flux and in controversy. And I think that it's partly because um, there are a number of reasons for that. One, one is a, a political sociological reason, which is that I think as a society, uh, we don't have agreement at the same level we have it on um, things like murder and rape and robbery about what the crimes should be. Uh, but I also think that from a lawyer's perspective, this is a very, and a, a judge's perspective, this is a very different thing, a very difficult thing to put hard definitional edges on. Um, and all of that adds up to a very uh, bountiful area to do uh, research and scholarship and thinking in. And I certainly hope that, you know, over the course of my career that I'll contribute something to the uh, process of trying to get us all, both within the legal profession and outside, a little bit clearer on what we want here, what we mean, and what the rules of the road are. Well, you've actually answered part of Francis's question, who wrote in by email, did you always plan on entering academia after practicing law? Uh, if not, how did you decide to focus on scholarship? Do you ever do you see yourself going back into, prosecute, in, into practicing law? No. Uh, I haven't missed the courtroom since the day I walked out. I uh, loved it, uh, had some great experiences, but uh, by the time I got done with the Enron case, I felt like I had done uh, pretty much, I was extremely lucky to have had a career in the Justice Department where I was able to do a whole bunch of really interesting things and in a, in a bunch of different areas. And I felt like, you know, I've, I've seen what there is to see. I've proven to myself what I want to prove to myself about what I can do. Uh, I don't see doing this uh, over and over again for 20 or 30 years. I was never... Uh, I didn't. I never liked trials just for the sport of trial. You know, there's some lawyers I think who, uh, who who just uh, uh, you know they would have been actors or something if they hadn't gone into the law. They love the performance uh, <laughs> aspect of trial law, uh, and that keeps them going. Some of them amazingly into their 70s. Uh, uh, some of these great trial lawyers. I would not have have been able to do that. Um, I was much more interested in the ideas behind what I was doing, the public policy questions, and, and naturally. Um, Academia was the place to go to continue to be able to work on that stuff, think about it, and uh, have the freedom to really, um, you know, continue to do and think about what I thought was the right thing, which is one thing I really liked about being a prosecutor that certainly you don't have the luxury of when you're representing clients. Um, and, uh, and I also knew I would love the teaching. I'm from a family of teachers. I was the first lawyer in my family, so I've, I sort of always, teaching was always the path not taken for me, and um, I... Uh, stayed in practice actually a little bit longer than I planned to just because the neat things kept coming along. So here we are in one of the great law schools in the country uh -huh. and we're a couple of hundred feet from one of the great, one of the great business schools in the country. Right. How, how do we, um, how, how do you as a, as a teacher and as a scholar, how do, right. how, how do law schools, business schools, universities uh, educate students to address these kinds of things early on. We're obviously not teaching people to go out and be white collar criminals, although right. there have been, there are some who would argue that the, the sort of philosophy and ethos in our business schools and law schools uh, might inadvertently promote that. So I'm just curious. How yeah, you, I don't know. This I, is a really how, difficult how, how uh, question. That? I mean, we, we have an ethics <clears throat> curriculum in the law school. Um, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the ethics curriculum uh, by force has to be related to the law of ethics. You know, lawyers are governed by uh, by an ethical code that is law. 
Um, and so it becomes essentially a doctrinal course in large part that teaches the law of ethics. And uh, the law of ethics for lawyers is very, very important. Obviously, it's the foundation that all lawyers have to work from. Um, but it doesn't answer most of the difficult questions uh, about how to handle tough situations and how to be an effective ethical lawyer. Uh, that is a very difficult thing to teach in the classroom. You know, I think that it helps to have people on the faculty who have been uh, in the trenches of the law and can uh, talk about examples I think that's what, you know, I always try to find uh, points in my substantive law courses where I can tie back to examples that teach lessons about lawyers being in difficult dilemmas and how to handle it. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, we could have a separate course that was just teaching examples of lawyers being in difficult situations and how to handle them, but the problem is that Everyone on our faculty comes from, who comes from practice comes from a different area of practice and has a narrow slice of that. So my wife, for example, who does some teaching here at Duke Law School, is a former transactional lawyer in the startup uh, business uh, sector. Uh -huh. um, she can talk about ethical dilemmas that in-house counsel uh, get into uh, in transactional work. I don't know anything about that. I can talk about ethical dilemmas the prosecutor's going to get into, but other people don't know anything about that. And I think it would actually be useful if we could create some kind of a um, a, a, a device for students that would bring that knowledge together into one place. The, the place they come together to teach ethics now, I mean, to learn ethics now, is with the professor who teaches the ethical rules, right? right? Which is a separate area of expertise. But we have, uh, let's see, one more question okay. uh, from Braxton by email. Do legislators do a good job of understanding the legal issues necessary to make good white collar criminal law? Probably not. Uh, and, a, and, I don't, and I think that at some level the legislators recognize that. And so what we have in the white collar area, especially in federal court, is an enormous amount of delegation from the legislature to the courts. Legislatures tend to write uh, fairly broad uh, statutes and uh, let the courts uh, try to uh, hammer out case by case some of the more detailed aspects of what those rules mean. Um, now, in theory, that's not supposed to happen in the criminal law. The statutes are supposed to tell you clearly, you know, where the line is. But in the area of white-collar crime, I believe it's almost impossible to do that. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it's inevitable that, for example, in the area of securities fraud, the courts are going to be working out uh, some of the details uh, as, they, as they go. And I think the legislature... Uh, gen generally recognizes that. They're hesitant to make the rules too specific because they do appreciate this point that we talked about earlier in our conversation that um, uh, we're trying to regulate a, a group here that uh, looks at legal rules and says, okay, uh, you know, how can we accomplish what we want to accomplish without violating the letter of this rule? Uh, our job isn't to worry about the spirit of the law, it's to worry about the letter of the law. And so if the law has too many letters in it, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a little too easy to get around. So the legislatures have a tendency to write barebone statutes and then leave it to the courts to kind of uh, work that out. Good. Sam, thank you very much. Okay, Thanks my pleasure. Here. Interesting conversation. Okay. You have been watching Office Hours from Duke University. We've been at the Duke Law School today talking with Sam Buell, a professor of law, expert on white-collar crime and corporate regulation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to watch this program and any of the uh, Duke Office Hours programs, you can go to ondemand.duke.edu and go through our video archive. Uh, and we invite you to come back next Friday. We're here every Friday at noon Eastern time uh, with another conversation with another interesting person from the Duke faculty. Thank you and have a good day. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.